The Unlikely Innovators with Mike Comito and Steve Gravel. Presented by Cambrian R&D and the Center for Smart Mining. Steve, I like to pride myself on being uh, quick on the record button when we interview with a guest. But today was probably the first time in the two years of recording where, you know, I should have been recording as soon as as soon as the call started because we had missed a few nuggets before our conversation started. But uh, but you were right to point out that we should be recording ASAP. We didn't even have the chance to do a formal bio because f- our guest today, Frank Stronick, who you've probably heard of as the founder and honorary chairman of Magna International. Uh, he was on the podcast today. So he joined the Unlike the Innovators. And as soon as we did our, our, our formal intros of, of each other, he just started rolling. And then we just kind of went from there. And I think we had a really good conversation with Frank, talked about his journey coming over to Canada from Austria in 1954. Uh, and then all the way till now, what he's hoping to do, which I think is pretty noble, is wanting to share and teach as much as he can with the time that he has left. But because I didn't have a chance to do a formal bio for Frank while he was on the call, I want to do it now before I get your thoughts. But as I well, mentioned, a man, a man, a man who doesn't really need an introduction, but like for our listeners, let's do it. Yeah, no, I think I, I agree with you. He doesn't need one, but we're going to give him one anyway. Uh, as I'd mentioned already, Frank Stronick is the founder and honorary chairman of Magna International, the world's most diversified automotive parts supplier with more than 160,000 employees in 28 countries and sales of over 35 billion. At Magna, he introduces unique management philosophy known as Fair Enterprise, which is based on a business charter of rights that predetermines the annual percentage of profits shared between employees, management, investors, and society. He is currently the founder and chairman of Stronic International, a company whose mission is to enhance society and the environment through micromobility, transportation, and organic agribusiness, two of the fastest growing economic trends in the world today. And of course, he had a whole list of accomplishments and milestones and Hall of Fames he's been inducted to. I opted not to use those today, but uh, suffice to say that we we were really happy to have Frank Stronick on the podcast today. I feel almost uh, that I should be calling him Mr. Stronick, but he, he let us call him Frank. Steve, what did you think of our conversation with, with well, Frank? Well, I mean, I, I couldn't help call him Mr. Stronick. I felt yeah. like I just, uh, I, I couldn't... Uh... I couldn't work up the courage to call him Frank, but uh, maybe next time he did say he would come on again. Mm-hmm. Um, and he did uh, say that if we write him an invite, he'll come and speak up here. So, uh, I, I mean, just what a treat to uh, the, the man's a legend. He's a giant in the industry. Uh, it was just great to, to spend what little time we had with him. Uh, uh, really memorable one for me, for sure. Mm-hmm. Well, I think on that note, let's just go right to Mr. Stronick and hear what he had to say. Mike and I had read an article you had put out that talked uh, particularly about your views on uh, post-secondary education uh, colleges and universities in particular. Do you have any particular thoughts on that? Yes, very much so. You know, uh, I'm, I'm saying we should end high school at grade 10 mm-hmm. and then the next two years, grade 11 and grade 12, kids should, would be mandatory. They should learn a trade technical trade, trade they all kinds of trades. So kids, if they have a chance, maybe every half a year, they they could learn maybe four different trades. I think if companies would hire, the companies would get a small amount. So the kids could, would get some pocket monies. Mm-hmm. And after the second year, I think uh, most companies would be willing to pay the kids some monies. So it's very crucial. We got to get back in uh, that, that we can make things. So I think it'd be great for the kids, be great for society, great for everything. It would be a win, win, win. And then kids can decide uh, what they want to do later on. Yeah, to go, me- go to university or stay with the trade or whatever. Yeah, and, and Frank, that's because, you know, Steve and I are calling you from uh, from Cambrian College here in Sudbury, Ontario. And again, I think one of the key parts about our college and a lot of the colleges in Ontario is is that hands-on component, that applied component, right? So I'm wondering, yes. in, in terms of that uh, that article you wrote for the National Post that Steve was referencing, you know, after you, yeah. you, you have the students kind of specialize and go into a trade, do you, like, what, how do you see the colleges as they currently are playing a role you know, in the system you've envisioned, do you feel that uh, the hands-on training that we're getting at the colleges now is sufficient well, to get the, the college, students? The college would have to maybe settle. Maybe they need maybe some working facilities where the kids could do learn a lot of hands-on, but they could play a role. It's it's like a trade school. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we, it's it's crucial. We 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 have to, you know. Years ago, I had maybe the largest skittle labor pool in the world. 
had about 5,000 tool makers employed. Huh? Mm -hmm. If Ford needed a new door or whatever, we could give it to them in, in, uh, in three months. Now it would take maybe a year, two years. Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have to get back. Uh, it's better for the, the kids will benefit, society will benefit, and the economy will better function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you'll you'll appreciate this because right behind me in the uh, in my office we have a shop and there's a five axis CNC in there and one of our students we've trained or he's trained himself I should say to operate that machine and he's in a mechanical engineering program but he's getting the hands on skills of a machinist uh, and That'd what be he's great. been able what what he's been able to do in a few short months uh, has been has been pretty awesome to see him he, him evolve and, and become more proficient yeah, on that yeah. machine. But we still have a certain amounts of called elderly people, which are uh, very experienced on all that technology and machines. They could be the teachers. Many mm -hmm. would be very happy to maybe spend some time in colleges and maybe teach younger kids, huh? Trades. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's very, it's, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> from uh, the two years will be very helpful. I think great for the kids, great for society. And because a lot of kids would like to stay maybe uh, because the problem with most kids is they, uh, they go into social sciences. Nothing wrong with that. So society needs balancing out. But if the economy doesn't work, nothing else will work. It, mm -hmm. Look, we we I think that should be so clear. If the economy doesn't work, we cannot feed the hungry. We cannot look after the most fragile ones. That mm -hmm. is the fundamental in the, in the, in the fundamental problem. So we got to make sure the arts will benefit. Everybody will benefit if the economy works. Mm -hmm. But we got to share with the workers. Workers have a right to some of the profits to help to generate. Well, yeah, and that's that's a great point, Frank, because one of the things we wanted to ask you today was that, uh, you know, when when you were at, when uh, with Magna, you implemented the, the management policy or philosophy, I should say, sorry, called Fair Enterprise, yes. in which you gave your employees a percentage in profits and gave them a share of the ownership. Uh, so we wanted to ask you, you know, when did you initially come to this realization that this was a smart business practice for Magna? And can you talk about some of those results that you saw over the years with the employees really buying into, into the company by having a stake in the ownership? Sure. Fair Enterprise basically is a philosophy. It's a culture. Fair Enterprise uh, basically, uh, basically states uh the human chart of rights alone is not sufficient we have to fortify it with an economic chart of rights economic charters of rights will lead to economic democracies and economic democracies are the basis for democracy itself if you haven't got economic democracy you haven't got democracy to a kid in an inner city detroit freedom doesn't mean anything it only means he's free to be hungry Hmm. So it is, we have to understand, look, uh, let me put it in simple terms. You heard of the golden rule? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. What is it? <laughs> um, only do unto others that you would do to yourself? No, 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 that's not the golden rule. The golden <laughs> rule is who, who has the gold makes the rule. <laughs> okay. The world has always been dominated by the golden rule. It still is. I don't want to be dominated by anyone. If I feel that strong, I should not be able to dominate somebody either. So the question is, how can we dismantle the chains of domination? Not via violent revolutions, via revolution of the mind. We must over and over preach and get to no violence. Society, uh, you know, so it's the mind. We have to change things. Workers must get a portion of the profits. Without workers, you can't make a profits. Mm -hmm. You cannot have the capitalist hogging in all the gold, all the money. It doesn't work that way. 
So it's very important, economic, uh, that we need economic charters of rights combined with the human charter of rights. And when you were implementing this at uh, Magna, what kind of results did you start to see as that sort of uh, played out? As you, like, because you were doing that in your company before yes. the rest before the rest of the world caught on to this. What what kind of results were you seeing? We grew. Like, I mean, how can you like from a garage up, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we had that growth, right? We built uh, basically all internal growth. We generated so much money, so much profits, and we put it in new machines and shared with the employees. We just, it's it's an incredible growth. Mm. And and let oh, me take you, you. Let me. I want to ask this question, kind of. Uh, uh, you came to Canada from Austria in 1954 with forty dollars, and this sort of goes to your point you just made. Two hundred dollars. Two hundred dollars. My mistake. Our research was poor. Uh, did you ever, in your wildest dreams, think that your journey would have gone this way? Was this by design, all, all by design, or, or are you sometimes no. shocked, shocked by yourself? Oh, you know, it's amazing. First of all, there's enormous potential in every human being, right? Really, it's a question of fate and circumstances. Are you at the right places at the right time with the right ingredients? So it's uh, no. I had no great philosophies. I just, uh, I just heard. Look, when you be in America or Canada, after half a year you work, you could afford to buy a car, right? My dream was always to have my own bicycle. I had to share it with my sister. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I, I had no thing here, right? It, it just, it just came as a, you know, I was exposed to. Uh, I was old enough to, to in hindsight, to to understand it a little bit the Nazi regime because we were we were occupied, right? Mm -hmm. So I was when the when the war ended, I was thirteen years of age. But doing the thing, so twelve years, uh, you 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 when you look back, you you understand some of the things. And then we were occupied by the by the Russians, so we had a communistic regime for a while, right? Mm -hmm. So I was exposed, and then I I came to Canada. I wanted to work. I walked the streets, wanted to work. I couldn't find a job. And I ran out of money, and when you run out of money, you get hungry because you got no money to buy food. Those are the steep impressions. So you got to question the system sometimes. Okay. So anyway, it was a question of fate and circumstances, and uh, and that's the way it turned out. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I was, I was blessed with good health and a good mind. But our father said, it doesn't matter how smart you are, if the stars are not aligned, it won't work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have to. I think good people are. I think most cases are more lucky or, or uh, the stars are well aligned, right? So my, you know, uh, I have a certain age, uh, you know, when we are younger, we all hustle to make some monies so we can live in dignity, look after the family. But I once when I've achieved all the thing, I became very, uh, you know, I questioned myself, what's the purpose of life? Purpose of life is... Can you make a contribution to have a better society, right? So the things I do now really goes in. Is it beneficial to society? If it's not beneficial, I wouldn't touch it. Mm -hmm. and Fr Frank, I just wanted to go back because you mentioned a point about how, you know, the stars have to align. And obviously when you first, you know, when you got to Canada and you first opened that, uh, you started working at a tool dye making shop and then you opened your own shop and it was a garage. And from there you scaled up. Can you talk about a little bit about that process and what it was like to go from, you know, grassroots starting in, in a garage to then scaling? You know, how did all that come about? Was it just from... Oh, it, it, again, circumstances, right? Like I said, uh, you know, uh, the, the first thing I... I I landed in Quebec City and the immigration, went, I took the cheapest uh, route with a coal freighter from Holland to, to Canada, Quebec City. When I got off the boat, the immigration officer said, do you know anybody in Canada? I said, no. So I said, well, they'll go to Montreal. So I went to Montreal, right? And 
I, my English was, I could understand quite a bit. So I inquired on the boat, how do you find a room? I, I know I do hundred dollars in a hotel that wouldn't last long. So uh, they said, uh, look, look around. Uh, when you see a sign and when the room's to let, knock on the door. So when I landed at a small uh, suitcase, right, uh, railroad, when I got out at the train station in, 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 in Montreal, um, uh, uh, so I kept walking the streets for a few hours till I found a room. And then the next day I was trying to, uh, I couldn't find a job, right? That was in 54, there was a great recession. So I saved enough money so for a Greyhound bus ticket from Montreal to Kitchener. Because I knew somebody there, not a close friend, but I knew somebody there from the same hometown. I had his address. When he got off the Greyhound bus in Kitchener, I was hoping, gee, I hope that guy is home because I was really hungry. So I walked for a few hours till I find the address, knocked on the door, and then a little lady answered. And um, the guy's name was Max. So she said, I heard her say, Max, there's somebody there which wants to see you. So uh, the guy came down, right? And he looked at me, he knew me, and said, gee, you look kind of rough. You must be hungry. I said, yes. So that's where great welcome was, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, then uh, he helped me find a job. Uh, so my first job in Canada was in a hospital washing dishes. Okay, so nothing against all the women, but they were just elderly women. I, my mother was an elderly woman. I liked that a lot, right? So anyway, I've seen everything. Mm -hmm. but then I found a job in a, in a kitchen which uh, made components for the for the the airplane, the chat fighter plane, the Arrow. Mm. That got canceled a year later, and everybody got laid off. I drifted to Oakville. Somebody gave me a ride down there because um, Oak, uh, Ford was starting at a factory in Oakville. So I lined up, you know, um, for a few hours for an interview. And I have some tool and time maker. They looked at me and said, you, you, You're too young. You mustn't have any experience. I couldn't get a job. Funny thing is, maybe years later, some of them said, "Tease the president of Ford." I said to him, "Look, <laughs> I got to gotten the job. You would be working for me now." I know him well <laughs> enough that they could tease him, right? <laughs> so anyway, so life. Uh, yeah. But anyway, I drifted to Toronto. Then I found a um, I found a job in a small tool shop. I worked there for half a year. Then the orders run out. I was laid off. Then I worked, uh, I worked one more job for another. When the owner said, gee, you're doing a great job. Uh, I want you to be a partner of mine. A nice guy, but never wrote it down. So my thing at that time then was saying, there's nothing to it if you run your own thing. So I left there and I had a few thousand dollars saved up. I rented a small garage, bought a few used machines on the town, went and out, out, I went hustling. I walked in the different factories and I said, look, I'm great in solving problems. If I can't solve the problems, you don't, you don't have to pay me. So anyway, I got some orders. I walked the one month, I hired one. After a year, I had about 10 people. After two years, 20 people. And after five years, about a thousand people. And after 10 years, about uh, 20,000. Okay, and after 10, uh, 50,000, 100,000, 150,000, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I came to the, uh, the very key thing is, from my first factory, after two years, I noticed my foreman was different. His name was Herman. I said, Herman, what's the matter with you lately? Well, he said, Frank, I'm been thinking of building my own factory. So I said, yeah, I can sympathize with that. And I said, look, why, we can do something together. Let me think about it. So let's talk tomorrow. So that evening was talking to myself. I said, if that foreman's going to leave me, you know, I got to do all the work. I didn't like that. The next reason was if that foreman's going to, if I hire a new foreman and don't show him, how a factory is run. If I show him how a factory is run, it's just a question of time before he leaves. Before he leaves, and then again. So anyway, the next day I said to him, 
look, why don't we start a new factory? No more overtime. You know, so uh, compared to the one which offered me once I didn't come around, we went right away to a lawyer, he wrote it down, and the guy was working like crazy. That was his factory. He owned one third, I owned two thirds. At the end of the time, we took some monies out and some monies we left in for growth. So that, uh, you know, uh, that was his factory. So I took the other form and the other, all of a sudden they had a whole bunch of factories. Okay. So I came to the conclusion, then it really came to me. I not only got to get uh, my my foreman, uh, my managers involved and have ownership, also the workers. So this way, I, I came to call it all that philosophy and all that structure, right? Whereby, um, you know, it's great if, if, if workers know they own um, shares or they know a portion or get a profit, they, they start to think differently. So that was the success. That was incredible. <laughs> um, we only have a half an hour with you today, uh, Mr. Stronick. I was going to ask you, uh, we have a lot of student listeners from our the college that we represent, Mike and I. And I was wondering, um, particularly particularly in like mechanical engineering, tool and die making, machining, millwright, those are the kind of programs we offer. Do you have any advice for those students? Uh, are the job prospects as good now as they've ever been? What what should they be thinking about? Well, um, the the highest paid workers we are to call it the skilled tool makers. Okay, some of them made five million or ten million a year, because basically, when you run a factory, m most of them were tool makers, mm -hmm. and so basically, I've said, look, if you re if you replace yourself, if you if you groom a manager, then you can open up a new factory, and the manager in the old factory, let's say had 3% of the profit, so he come back from three to two, but he picked up 3% in a new factory. So the more often a manager could replace himself, that means he could manage a group, then 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 factories, and thereby he gets a profit from each factory. So it was a huge incentive for the workers, for the manager, for everybody. So uh, I, I, I think it's great. And we had a, I had a lot of good managers. They started out in trade and went back to the university at a later stage in stages, right? Mm. So uh, those were our best guys. Okay, That's sort so, of uh, con continuing the education as they as they progress. Yeah, yes, you know to to get uh, some of um, so, do some technology, uh, you know where where um, where you got formulas, where you got the, which which um, is more you call it uh, paper formulas, right? And, and mm -hmm. but you need that too, right? And the yeah. practical hands-on is on the machines, et cetera, et cetera. So in any way, it's, um, I used to give a lot of lectures, right? From Harvard, right across uh, the States and Canada, I, in hundreds of universities over the years, I always told the students, the success of life can only be measured the degree of happiness you reach. But I, at the same time, I told them, the students, but let me tell you from my experience, it's a lot easier to be happy if you got some monies. <laughs> my students usually ask, well, how can you make some monies? Well, I said, if you've been in your early 20s or just about 20, you don't know yourself. Experiment a bit. Do something what you enjoy. If you enjoy something, you're going to be good in it. If you put in the extra effort, you could be one of the best, whatever it is. A uh, woman or a man, money is a byproduct if you be one of the best. Hmm. So that's the very key. But you got to, when you be an owner, you got to let them participate. The more they participate, the more money you make. That's that's great, Frank. We, uh, you know, we're, we're conscious of your time now, but before we let you go, we yes. wanted to maybe ask you this. Uh, obviously, you know, you've accomplished so much in your life. So one 
what's next? What does Frank Stronach still want to accomplish? And two, if you wanted to leave us with any final thoughts uh, before we let you go, you've been really generous with your time today. This is such a great country. And when you look back in history, changes always took place via the universities. So my main aim is to do a lot of teaching over the next two years while my mind still functions well. I want to I wanna transmit, call it that wisdom or knowledge, to the younger generation. That's what my conscience tells me. And when you look back in histories, all the cultures had wise men, right? Okay, and uh, so I, I think as you grow older, you accumulate more wisdom. And I like to transmit that. And I hope to maybe do some lectures up at your university or your, at your college. Well, we'd, oh, we'd I, I think there, I think there'd be a lot of people who would love that. To be honest with you. Okay, you, if you, you get sent his uh, email and you send me a thing, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make it up there. Okay, okay. That'd be awesome. because, yeah, I, I think uh, it's it's very you know I I have like I said from New York Stock Exchange and the corporate governance I I've accumulated so much uh, wisdom and uh, I think my conscience tell me Frank uh, transmit it mm -hmm. transmit it to to younger people. Yeah, well. We couldn't agree with you more, Frank. We'd love to have you up here, up north at Cambrian College. And again, we uh, hope you're able to transmit as much of that knowledge as you can, because uh, you've, you've got a lot of it. It'd be great to share with the world. You write me an invitation and I will come up there. Okay. Oh, awesome. We will do that. But uh, but okay. until then, we want to thank you for, for joining us on the great. podcast today. It's been great chatting with you. And uh, yeah, very inspirational story. So thanks for your time today. Okay, great to be with you guys. You nice talk to, to you, you soon, man. Take Anytime care. you want to have another chat, give, give us a call. Okay, awesome. okay. I'll do. Thank Thanks you. so much. Mike, what a great podcast episode. Uh, again, obviously, Frank Stronach, founder uh, of Magna, uh, legendary guy. You could tell uh, still firing on all cylinders, to, mm -hmm. to pardon the pun. Yeah, no, it was, uh, you know, it was one of those, uh, I think it, it came across this, you know, obviously I, we'd known about Magna in, in our world, obviously with the machining and advanced manufacturing, you know, we do here in applied research, but also at the college, the skilled trades programs. But uh, so I'd always known the name, obviously is a Titan of industry. So the Stronic name is well known in Canada and beyond, but it was a, that article that he wrote in the national post that we referenced mm -hmm. where he was talking about, you know, the future of, of, of higher education, what that might look like. And I think a lot, what he was talking about is just kind of the role that colleges are playing now. Right. I think, you know, you're looking for to get a mixture of that theoretical, but also that critical hands-on and that applied aspect, which I think, you know, colleges in Ontario are providing, and especially those applied research departments at those colleges where not only you're getting that hands-on as part of a project, which is taking the skills you're already learning in the classroom and developing. We didn't get a chance to talk to Frank about applied research, but I think, you know, based on what he was talking about and his own experiences, I think that would have been right up his alley. Um, and I think certainly a cause that he would certainly support, especially now when he's looking to try to empower students to try to get those skills so they can get those jobs, but not just get the jobs, but get something that they want to do and that they'd be happy doing. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, you love the yarns, of course, you know, about uh, not getting that job at Ford. Um, <laughs> it's just a, uh, just a great piece of history as a life lived. And it was just a, a real treat to, uh, to hang out with him for, for uh, a little while. Yeah, I know. And I think it's safe to say that he did get his own bicycle. You know, that's yeah, it's yeah. funny when you think about like how your goals, you know, change throughout change. your life. Um, you know, for him, that first thing that he wanted was to have his own bicycle because he had to share his with his sister. Uh, but yeah, I think he's been able to buy himself many bicycles many times over uh, throughout his illustrious career. Let's hope he has. <laughs> well, uh, thanks for joining us again, as always, this week on the Unlikely Innovators. I uh, hope you enjoyed our conversation with Frank Stronach. We will be back again with new content as always. So tune in next week for another new episode of The Unlikely Innovators. Goodbye. The Unlikely Innovators with Mike Comito and Steve Gravel. Presented by Cambrian R&D and the Center for Smart Mining.